All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to Fate's Wide Wheel. I'm Sam. I'm Dennis. And this week, we have the distinct pleasure and honor of talking about Let Them Play with Shakina, the writer, the director, the actor. There's nothing that she doesn't do over the course of, of this episode. And uh, we, get to, we get to do the deep dive with the, the writer, director, and actor uh, riding along with us. And uh, it's a treat. And we're looking forward to sharing it with you. Before we do all that, Dennis, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Today has been such an interesting day. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it this way. We woke up this morning not knowing that we were going to be talking with Shakina. Uh, certainly not knowing that we were going to do our episode with Shakina. Like when we realized that we were going to get the chance to talk with her, we thought it was literally just going to be like, a, you know, kind of like a quick interview. And then, you know, we, we basically were able to, to just, you know, she was gracious and we were talking about it and she was just like, let's just do the whole episode. It's like, okay. So there we go. <laughs> so that happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this, yeah. this, yeah, it's wonderful. It's a face wide wheel first to have someone like actually involved in the episode riding shotgun with us. So yeah. it's a little mix of interview, a little mix of talking about the episodes, but I cannot think of any better way that we could have talked about specifically about this episode. I completely agree. It was, yeah, I mean, I, it was the, it was really the best way to do it in so many, in so many ways. Like I, I have no doubt that, and not to pat ourselves on the back, but I have no doubt that you and I would have been able to have a thoughtful, you know, good discussion about the episode, but, you know, having Shakina with us to, you know, to, to walk through things and, and talk about things. And it was just such an incredible experience. Um, you know, we mentioned this to her, I think, before we started recording that, We've learned so much since, you know, October, since the show started airing and, uh, it, it, I, you know, we've said it before, but to go from talking about a show that was off the air for almost 30 years to talking about a show that's on the air and talking with the people that are involved in the creation of said show, I, it has been such an incredible experience and we feel so lucky to be able to, you know, to, to talk with people about the show and to share that with, with the listeners and the viewers, because, um, you know, more than anything, we, we want everybody to feel like they're, they're riding along with us and, you know, and experiencing this with us and hopefully learning just like we are, because it's been, it's been an incredible, uh, learning experience just f for, you know, for the way that, television is made uh, uh yeah. you know and and the passion of the creators and the you know and, and and everything that goes on behind the scenes and the importance of you know just every little aspect to that you know sure you listen to a few audio commentaries or watch a behind the scenes documentary and you certainly kind of like you know you're like oh yeah yeah an editor they do this or whatever but to just like mm -hmm. really kind of hear about it and and see it in action and and, and um get the opportunity to uh, um, hear about the, those last minute changes or those moments of sure. magic, you know, uh, which mm -hmm. there are, are, are a number, uh, that, that happened throughout the course of this episode. Uh, it's, it's just cool. It's, it's, uh, it's something that I'm very, very, very grateful for. Yeah. Looking forward to sharing this. Uh, first of all, we're going to thank some patrons and give you a little note. So if you are watching or probably listening to this, you're probably going to pick this up a little bit. We had a little technical glitch. So we are starting this episode <laughs> on Riverside. We are ending it on Zoom because something on Shakina's end was locking up in Riverside. And it was like, eh, this may be a one-time glitch or it may keep happening. So let's not keep doing that. So let's just switch over to Zoom. Uh, Zoom is not as high quality, but it is uh, it is old reliable. So thank you, Zoom. Yeah, Zoom is not a sponsor. You know the funny of thing is, wheel, I will, but it could be. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that back. Uh, <laughs> you know, I will say the funny thing is, is that uh, for me, it was actually the Zoom was actually smoother. Uh, now I know that Riverside like records all of our feeds individually, so it look it will you know it looks better from those individual feeds. Yet Zoom what I was seeing of you, what I was seeing of Shakina was actually higher quality than what I was seeing in Riverside. <laughs> That's how it works sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyway, well, let's, uh, let's, let's thank uh, these yeah. wonderful people. Let's thank some patrons and then let's uh, get in, get into the episode. Uh, we want to thank Al's Place, Leap Fan Site, Bourbon and Board Games, Carolyn, Cosplay Dad, Joanne Bartlett, Dana Bias, Rich Bork, Kevin, and Kevin Butcher, Carol Davis, and Dex Lower, Dermot Devlin, Barry Donovan, 
Brian Dreadful, Troy Evers, Larry Ganey, Jason Geis, Michelle Hoffman, Amy Holtkamp, Lori Johnson, Beth Say Corey, Lady Eternal, Rob Nunn, Oddly Specific with Audra, Christopher Redmond, Adrian Saul, Karen Saxon, Jerry Seward, Mike Stouffer, Heather Strabiak, Damon Sugamelli, Larry Trujillo, Stuart Williams, Joe Wilson, our anonymous donors, and as always, a special shout out to Jessica Conger and Betsy Freimeyer, our spouses who provide vital child care while we record our show. If you would like to become a patron, uh, I'm just going to keep it brief this time. Check our show notes. There are a couple different ways to do it, either through Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee. That information is is in our show notes. Find us there. Or you can just send us some good old-fashioned feedback. Send us an email at fateswidewheelpodcast at gmail.com. Fantastic. And thank you all so much for your support. Um, whether you're donating to the show or not, uh, whether you started listening tonight, last week or five years ago, because that's how long we've been doing this now. Um, um, thank you so, so much for your support. It means the world to us. Um, and as Dennis said, if you want to support the podcast, um, by all means, you know, check out one of those channels. Um, but all we ask is that you're, you know, trying to set things right where they once went wrong and maybe donating to your community uh, or a charity of your choosing. Uh, of course, in this particular instance, give a big shout out to the Trevor Project um, um, because I think that this episode, especially, um, it's it's important to make sure we're um we're supporting we're being accomplices in addition yes. to allies uh yeah. so gonna, thank was, you all uh, so much yeah i was gonna mention the trevor project i know because we talked about it uh we put this out on twitter but since you brought it up uh we have a couple pieces pieces of merch in our merch store uh related to uh ian's comments about gender from fellow travelers so we have a couple like t-shirts or mugs you can put it on stickers i think any proceeds that we get from the sale of those, those go to the Trevor Project. And I didn't tell you, but I don't know if you're familiar on TikTok. You can choose a charity to to donate to. And basically, it just sticks on your profile, and that encourages people to donate. And you can kind of go in and see, like, how many people have donated to a charity through your TikTok profile. So uh, I have set the Trevor Project as as our charity on TikTok. I don't, I don't think I ever told you that, actually. So uh, No, no, it's awesome. Project. Yeah, uh, I think it's it is so very, uh, it's very apropos for for some things that have come up in these last few episodes, and especially this episode. So unless you yeah. have anything and else, so, without any further ado, well, I, I will just say real quick, but even even sure. some of the things that come up specifically in our conversation with Shakina. So I think that that's you know that that's is incredibly apropos, and incredibly important that uh, you know again that we're we're supporting, um, however. However, we can. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, real quick before we, we throw it over to our episode overview, one thing that we didn't do is kind of our non-spoiler overview. So very briefly, Dennis, what are your non-spoiler thoughts about Let Them Play? Oh, God, you caught me off guard here. Um, <laughs> the, the, the first thing I had is that uh, this is this Quantum Leap's color of truth. Uh, like the first real strong episode that takes an issue head on. Um, yeah. And, and and I said it when we were talking to Shakina, she had said on social media that this is really a, a love letter to trans kids. And I really felt like that's what it was. And she clarified that, you know, talk about, they go, it was, it was to that, but it was also a message to, to people of all walks of life to, uh, like I said, to, to not preach and not hit you with, with talking points, but to hit you with a very human perspective, no matter where you're coming from. Um, but yeah, I about halfway through, like I, I realized I've been kind of expecting like a ripped from the headlines kind of story. And about halfway through the episode, I was like, no, this is not this is not that kind of episode. Um, and like this is a mess. Like if I were, you know, she said that like episodes like this will will save people's lives, and and I think. I think that is very, that is true. That is very literal. Like, uh, cause I was watching it last night and thinking like, if I was a transgender kid, like an episode of television like this may very well save my life. And I don't know Absolutely. what else I can say, what else I can say about it. How about you? Um, I think that that's beautifully put and I completely agree with that. Um, and I think going even one step further from color of truth. Um, everyone knows how much I love thou shalt not. 
And I think mm. that there's some strains of that too. You know, the way that that episode, t- you know, tells a family drama and, 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 you know, is an episode about grief and mourning. Um, and the way that this episode, you know, again, it's a, it's a family drama while also telling a story about trans youth. Um, it's beautifully done and there's so many wonderful moments and I, you know, I've had the luxury of watching it twice so far. Uh, by the time this airs, I'll probably watch it three or four <laughs> times. Um, and, and the first time I felt like the episode went by so fast, like it comes at you. That was one of the things that Shakina says later. And yet watching it the second time, it was like, I was able to just willfully like slow down time in a way and really take the episode in. And it was another reminder about how well the show is holding up upon repeat viewings, how it continues to kind of unfold itself. And because there are a lot of layers and and there are so many themes that they're getting across and there's overarching themes um, about identity and about family. Um, And this episode certainly leans into those um, a great deal. You know, and, and technology too. I mean, there's still some stuff about technology that runs the course of this episode, which is something that they've been yeah. playing on. But all aside from that fact, the most important thing, and it's what you said so well, is that this is the type of episode that can truly save a life. Um, yeah. Just to make someone feel seen, um, to make them know that it's okay to be them, and to, you know, to to to, to say that, you know, we've always been here we're still here and I can still be here. Um, you know, that I don't have to disappear. I don't have to get lost. I don't have to allow myself to be erased. Uh, and I think that that is just so incredibly important and I think it does it so well. And it also has some absolutely hilarious moments. Uh, it's got a wonderful sense of humor about itself, which I think is great. Something. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite visual moments in the episode, and I'm curious to see if you caught it is that after Gia runs away, Addison is working frantically on her hand link while Miriam is working frantically on her smartphone <laughs> and they're, they're not standing side by side, but they're kind of like, like one right yeah. in front of the other. And I, I immediately saw it. I was like, Oh yeah. I was like, laughed out loud. Ha visual gag. Yeah. Uh, the, the first opportunity that quantum leap has had to do that because this is the first leap into the smartphone era. Right. Right. That's yeah, it's a great point. And there's even a call out to Angry Birds at one point, which I thought was <laughs> priceless. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um so I I am so excited that by the time people are listening to this that, you know, everyone who tunes in on Monday night will have seen it. Um, and that it, it will be out there, right. That, that it will be yep. it, as, as Kate, as the character of Kate says, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't, you couldn't hide me, you know, it's like, you can't hide <laughs> yeah. this episode. And, uh, and, and, and I'm so glad that, uh, um, you know, that Shakina and the cast and the crew were able to share, uh, a piece of television like this. And I think we're incredibly fortunate to be at a time when not only do we have this incredible episode of quantum leap, but we're also hot on the heels of, of, of that episode of, uh, last of us, which told this incredible incredible, you know, queer love story. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and now, you know, here we are a little over a week later and we're getting this, you know, incredible, uh, uh moment, this love letter, like yeah. you said, to trans youth, this, this care bear stare of joy. It's, it's yeah. pretty special. Yeah. Do you just- all right. All right. All right. We, we've been anything but brief as usual. Uh, yeah. so let's go <laughs> ahead and do, and do this right. Uh, and give the people what they want. Um, and that is, uh, our wonderful conversation about the episode, let them play with Shakina Dennis. Shakina is a celebrated actress and activist. She initially made television history on NBC's Connecting as the first transgender person to play a series regular on a network comedy. She can also be seen in Amazon's GLAAD award-winning Transparent Musical Finale, which she helped write and produce, and Hulu's Difficult People as the iconic trans-truther Lola. Her play, Shanbury International Hotel and Butterfly Club, premiered on Audible in 2020 in collaboration with Williamstown Theater Festival and was recognized with a 2021 Drama League Award for Best Audio Theater Production. She is the founding artistic director of Musical Theater Factory, where she helped to develop hundreds of new musicals, including Michael R. Jackson's Tony and Pulitzer Prize winning A Strange Loop, along with her own autobiographical glam rock odyssey, Manifest Pussy. Recognitions include the Lilly Award for Working Miracles, Theater Resources Unlimited Humanitarian Award, the Kilroy's List, Logo 20, two-time Drama League fellow, and two-time out 100 honoree. And of course, 
She is the writer of Quantum Leaps, Episode 12, Let Them Play, where she also appeared as Dottie in the episode, and she directed the majority of the episode. All right, Leapers, fellow travelers, we are so excited. We have Shakina here with us, and we are going to be discussing Let Them Play. Shakina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you. Yeah, it's uh, it really is a privilege. Uh, as soon as we uh, were fortunate enough to read the audition sides for this episode, um, which was, you know, it's been some weeks now, to say the least, a couple months, um, mm -hmm. you know, we just were so looking forward to the episode and uh, hoping that we would get the opportunity to chat with you. Um, because I think from the very beginning of hearing that the show would be coming back, uh, we knew it would have the opportunity to tackle some issues that were extremely relevant. And this is, uh, while not the first episode to certainly deal with some important issues, I think is the the one to deal with issues that are the most present. Um, and, and it feels very important to do so. So it, it really is a privilege uh, for us to have you here and to be able to talk about this episode with you. Well, thank you. I'm so uh, honored to be part of the legacy that is Quantum Leap because I, I feel like this episode, you know, my intention was to do what I remember Quantum Leap doing for me, you know, when I was a kid. And so it's just cool that yeah. um, that the show is staying true to its heart, you know. Absolutely. So how familiar were you with the show uh, prior to working on it? I wasn't like actively familiar, like it wasn't in the forefront of my consciousness, but it was something that I watched every week as a kid, you know, growing up, I was born in 80. So I was what, like eight, nine, 10, 11, you know, and I, rem I remember, uh, you know, seeing the Don't Ask, Don't Tell episode and what a big deal it was and like watching it with my parents and like, um, and knowing that it was like secretly about me, you know, um, and I was like 10 years old. So mm. um, I, I always remembered the parts of the, what I what stuck with me was the empathy engine of the show and un, and just knowing that like remembering how there was always you know an hour a week where we were walking a mile in someone else's shoes and my family we were doing it together you know and so that's what I brought in with me you know to the job interview and <laughs> and then um you know, and then also went back and watched a bunch <laughs> of them. And, you know, and it's funny because, like, the things that I cherished are still there. And there's also a lot of things that we're, like, trying to correct with this new version, you know. So uh, it's cool to have the opportunity Absolutely. to rewrite history again. Yeah, uh, I, I love that. I love that uh, the words empathy engine. Uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about empathy and compassion on the show, but uh, never have we put it so wonderfully as saying empathy engine. So I, I love that notion because I think it's it's absolutely the case with the show, both the original yeah. series and with the revival. Um, and I, yeah, I you know, and and I I am curious too that when you know when you did come aboard for the show um what was that process like for you because obviously I mean, you've been working you've been working at nbc you know even prior to to this but but what was the process like to come aboard as a writer for uh quantum leap and be a part of that writer's room well it was you know a new experience for me i, I had been in the writer's room on uh season five of transparent but we were writing a movie musical so it didn't have the challenges of uh, you know, uh, like a whole series. Um, in an interesting way, though, I learned a lot from that experience, what it was to like lay a, a, a legacy piece to rest, um, I brought that to understanding how to like bring a legacy piece back to life, you know, so I, I'm, I'm really lucky that the, the experience that I've had in writers rooms have been around kind of like iconic projects. Um, but <laughs> you know, it's it's such a it's such a thrilling room. Um, everyone ha has been so uh, positive and collaborative, and the the impulse to um, to speak to perspectives and point of views that don't get center stage on network TV is like a, a shared impulse. That everyone in the room is uh, constantly finding new ways to bring characters from the margins to the center in our A story. And, um, and that's just what I, what I love to do. And, and so, yeah, that part was like, great. 
Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that we have loved about the show since even before it began airing is once the announcement of the cast was made, the representation has been so important. It's so vital. And uh, I've loved seeing each week that the, the show never shies away from kind of upping the ante, if you will, when it comes to, to representation. Um, to the point that, you know, when we talked with Benjamin and Derek, uh, one of the things that went completely unnoticed to me the first time I watched the episode, but in paging Dr. Song, there's not one white male speaking character throughout the whole episode. Um, and, 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 and I just think that it's so cool to be able to bring that level of representation to network television. Um, obviously let them play, I think takes it even further by having, you know, trans representation front and center. Um, and, and not just with Gia, but, but obviously with, with counselor right. Kate, um, you know, with yourself as Dottie and being able to, to have that level, um, of representation, even behind the scenes, obviously, because you wrote the episode and you directed the episode. Mm -hmm. Um, how important has it been to you to see that level of representation um, from the show and knowing that you're on a network? Yeah, it's a major network television program airing in prime time. Yeah. Yeah, it's so huge. And, and the thing that really matters to me is that it's not singular, you know. And first we had Marquise Vilson in uh, Salvation or Bust. Um, and he's a trans actor and we didn't even really talk about it in the episode. He just talked about like always looking for a place where he could be yeah. himself, you know? Um, uh, and that was really cool. And, um, you know, with this episode, it's like trans center and left and right, you know? Um, but the point is, is that, <laughs> you know, so often in these issues of representation, you get like one shot, you know, there's one role, one story, one aspect. And, I really wanted to challenge that trope of singularity and isolation that we get with these trans stories. Like we don't exist in vacuums. We have communities, we have friends and, and, um, and there's so many different ways to experience transness. So, um, you know, from Mason's uh, point of view to Trace's point of view, my point of view, Josie Lynn's point of view, you meet a bunch of other uh, kids in a support group. I mean, there's just like so many expressions of trans identity that uh, I think just sort of like, break the mold because people who don't have uh intimate connection to a trans person they, they're sometimes like making up in their mind what they think it is or what they've seen from hollywood which is you know like i said we get these singular moments so this is something that feels different yeah, ah, I love that. I, that. That's such a wonderful way to put it, because I think that that's one of the things that is striking about the episode. And I'm curious as to how intentional it was to have all of these discussions, if you will, feel so different, uh, you know, just the way that the characters are represented, because obviously in the leap in the past in 2012 it's you know it's a huge issue you know gia being trans is is one of the driving factors of the the plot of the leap and yet in present day we meet dotty and nothing is made of it or said of it you know it's treated completely like it's it's not a thing right like as it should be right um and so i'm just curious like how intentional was was that you know that separation between past and present um and and the way that the characters are treated and the way that the other characters relate to them yeah i'm so glad you picked up on that you know originally when we were creating like the character that became dotty when we just knew the, the backstory that we were shaping you know um i hadn't considered that like a role for me in that we were kind of picturing something else and i was like oh i really want to be a guest star in quantum leap but not the trans episode like i want to do something that's not the trans episode <laughs> you know and then when yeah. i realized that that we could like inject transness into the hq story you know in a way that was just you know comical and fun and not really uh <laughs> like really really sort of comic relief you know and uh, and still really deep yeah. you know there's things that i say in as dotty that um that are really meaningful you know but um but so tongue-in-cheek and it's so nice to have this like really deep intense family drama you know uh packed inside a teen sports movie in 42 minutes with uh with then <laughs> this like you know these cutaways to uh you know, for all intents and purposes, like a Shakespearean clown, 
You know what I mean? It's like it's like that. That yes, was the sort totally. of trope that I was trying to channel. Yeah. I, that was so successful. One of the notes I took is that like the juxtaposition between, I, I believe it's when Gia is, 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 you know, having that moment with, um, with Ben, uh, you know, basically, you know, kind of like appreciating the fact that he's trying to relate to her and you know, the story of Ben's song, but like, but that's mm-hmm. not my story. And, and then right. immediately we cut to, uh, Dottie, uh, uh, doing the, the poetry slam and it's, and it, it was Shakespearean. That's exactly what I wrote down because that juxtaposition position was one that it, it was exactly the type you have this heavy moment and then you bring us up with this you know this just joyous you know moment that you can't help but laugh at um and yet you layer in all of this stuff with the choreo poem which is also just fantastic <laughs> um where it starts to dawn on us and magic in that same moment it's like oh shit like Dottie mm-hmm. has been leapt into like it's like that's yeah. exciting um yeah. which which we'll certainly get to uh um, I I want to but but no like, I, I I totally came across please Dennis yeah so I wanted to ask so uh one of our listeners on uh Twitter Joy she posted a thing uh the other day making the connection that Dottie is sometimes a nickname for Dorothy Dorothy Wizard of Oz the themes of Wizard of Oz played heavily into the original series finale Mirror Image is Dottie in some way connected <laughs> to the idea? Because, like, the last episode of Mirror Image, like, the themes of uh, wanting to go home. What is the definition of home? What does it mean to leave home? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to throw that out there. Was that an intentional thing? I love that. Or is that just something that's so that's so layered that someone can reach in and pick that up? I mean, I, I love that. You know, um, <laughs> When I did Jessica Jones, I did like one episode of Jessica Jones and I played this character called Frankie who was like originally listed as Francis and people in the MCU went wild because they thought I was going to be Nova the Human Torch because she was both Frankie and Francis. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's like maybe Dottie is Dorothy (laughs) and it's like because I'm just I'm just downloading the information I get to write the script. You know what I mean? I'm only dipping into the <laughs> atmosphere of of data to collect enough for one episode. But the truth is out there, you know. So I'm sure. down. <laughs> right. Well, I, and and I mean, obviously, that callback to to mirror image also uh, almost being mirrored. No pun intended. With the fact that uh, Dottie's a bartender, basically, which you know, in in, in the uh, in the final episode, um, you know, Al, the bartender is the one that, that gives Sam, you know, basically the ability to, to travel on and to the knowledge that, that he's been the one doing it himself the whole time. Um, yeah. one of the things that, about the opening of the episode that I, that I love is that you, like you said, we get this sort of teen sports movie, you know, a player's injured and somebody has got to come off the bench and take their place. And, uh, and then we get the buzzer beater and, and, and it's like, it's so exciting and it's, and it's fun. And then we start to hear people booing and Addison relays the information to Ben that Gia is trans. And all I could think in that moment is like, how sad that so succinctly and so simply we can explain the boos with just that piece of information. One of the things that I feel like the show has done so well is, is be able to relay that information, like the economy in which, you know, sometimes information is relayed. And yet in this particular moment, it carries even more weight. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about sort of like crafting that, that moment and that, that opening scene? Cause obviously it's so important to drawing us in. Yeah. Well, you know, so many of the moments in the episode are inspired by my own experiences growing up in high school in Orange County. And so I, I, mm. I took a lot of my own formative moments and, um, and also uh, some formative moments of, um, a couple of dear friends of mine who unfortunately are no longer with us because they didn't they didn't make it through that time, uh, and and mm. I knew going into the episode that I had like a long list of things that were important to me that we see you know, and then it was figuring out how to how to have the conversations and see the things that that mattered, uh, you know, in in the most succinct journey possible and. Um, and, and thankfully, because the episode sort of like 
follows the tropes of a teen sports movie, there was a path already laid out for me. You know, I took <laughs> this really conventional form yeah. of like, you know, I was inspired by She's the Man and Ladybugs and just one of the guys and all these gender swap teen sports movies that sort of, you know, use transness as a punchline. And I kind of wanted to like sort of reclaim that in a way and, and, and build on the genre. And so, mm. um, so I had that formula and then it was about taking all these moments that mattered to me and finding ways to work them into the formula. And one thing I'll just say that is true for all, every episode of Quantum Leap in the writer's room, you know, we are, we're all on a zoom looking at, uh, columns or rows of cards, depending on how you want to break it out. But we have our teaser and our five acts. And as we break them out, you know, every sort of important event and exciting thing like get the spot on the board but inevitably what happens is stuff that we think is like so cool in act four or like so great in act five ends up coming all the way into act two because we're just like keep it going condense it more and like get more story so you know on one day we think like we mm. found the beginning middle end and then that end is actually only act two you know what i mean so that's why wow. we have so many you know we call them card turns for a reason because they're literally cards. They're also page turning moments. You know, you just want to keep, you want to <laughs> keep tuning in. And so again, I took those moments that mattered to me, whether it was like seeing the support group, seeing um, Gia and her counselor together, seeing um, Gia and the character of Amanda have this like this conversation in front of the principal's office about like, do you, do you not support me? I just, there were so many aspects that I was like, we have to work these in. Um, you know, Addison's monologue about the trans ban in the military. I mean, literally, I, when I describe this episode to my friends, I say, like, you, you wipe your eyes and you're like, wow, that was groundbreaking. And then literally there was another scene that you make you cry and is groundbreaking. And um, I'm really fucking proud of that. Oh, yeah. can I say that? Okay, I am. Yes, you okay. can. Absolutely. Have you listened to our fucking show? <laughs> 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 so one thing I, I wanted to ask, or I wanted to point out is I, I, somewhere on social media in the last few days, you said that this episode, you really saw it as a love letter to trans kids. And what I, what I really realized that was in the, in the group counseling scene, when you have that wonderful montage of showing the the trans kids as the parent is giving uh, the monologue about about what it is to to be a trans kid to be a parent of a trans kid when i realized like oh like this episode is not this episode is like truly like a message to transgender youth it is not so much a ripped from the headlines kind of story which is i was something i didn't realize until that moment like oh i'm expecting this episode to be this it is not really speaking to me as a cisgender straight man. It is truly, it is a love letter to, to trans kids. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you, you felt that. And, and I think that what I, what I tried to do with the episode was really telegraph a lot to a lot of different people. And the first thing that was important to me was that trans kids saw themselves and felt loved and supported. And that was just the most important message I could put out there in the world. But also you know, there are, there are so many moments in the script that speak to the experience of not knowing how to support a trans kid, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's Ben saying, like, I, what do I know about supporting a trans kid? And Addison saying probably as much as any parent of a trans kid at first, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, to the, the monologue that the dad has while we're watching the living portraits of those kids, to even Margie, who sort of appears as our antagonist, but ultimately has a, uh, a kind of change of heart in the, in the episode, I really wanted to make different avenues for understanding open to people because I knew that like a lot of people watch Quantum Leap and a lot of people might be watching Quantum Leap having never even thought about this issue before, mm -hmm. and never feeling like it affects them or they need to have a horse in the race at all, you know, or maybe they feel conflicted or even like they agree that trans kids shouldn't play sports. And so I wanted everyone to be able to come to the table around the episode mm -hmm. and then hopefully come to the conclusion that like, we just need to let kids be kids. And that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah. I, that, that's when uh, I think when Gia has that moment um, where she looks at her parents and says, you know, thank you so much for letting me be myself. Now just let me be a kid. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very 
powerful moment because I think that it also reinforced that idea that, you know, there's, there's so much made, um, about, um, the intention of some people to other trans kids, you know, to, to yeah. make it a, you know, a, 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 a situation to try to set them apart. And I felt like what that really did, you know, better than I, I, you know, I can recall recently, especially on network television is just the reminder that like, no, I just want to be a kid. You know, I just, I just need to be a kid. Yeah. Um, well, at the, at the end of the day, what we see with, with um, both Gia's mom and Amanda's mom is that they're both just trying to protect their daughter, you know, and because it adolescence is scary and dangerous and high school is scary and dangerous and it shouldn't be, but it is. And yeah. so I think, you know, what I was trying to get at, you know, because these things, they, they have nuance, you, you know, there's not like a, you know, yes, I can say black and white, like let trans kids play trans rights are human rights. Like I can lay that down. But in terms of like a case by case instance, when you're dealing with the trans kid at your school or your kid comes out as trans or your kid's friend comes out as trans, like suddenly there's a lot of things that require a lot of nuance. You have to really, really listen in to all the different factors at play so that you can make the right choice for everyone, you know? And um, the like, the like political wedge issue talking points don't allow for that. They just don't. And what we get to do in this episode is open the door to that and give people insight into like what the real lived experience is of a family with a trans kid just trying to get through it, you know? And I think that will be life-saving for a lot of people to see and, um, and also, you know, hopefully mind opening and, and heart opening for a lot of other folks. Yeah, I, you know, and I think that that's one of the things that's been very difficult for me when coming up against people that are expressing bigoted ideas, because, yeah, kids are dying, you know, and, and, yeah. and it's so hard not to get incredibly emotional and and angry and frustrated about that and yet one of yeah. the beautiful things about this episode is you you said it when we first started it's a family drama and to be able to focus on those things and tell that story um like you said it goes far beyond just saying trans rights or human rights or just waving that flag mm -hmm. um and and i think that it it hopefully you know i i think obviously this is you know anyone who uh has some skin in the game as as <laughs> ian says uh that's that's i think how you want the episode to connect to people um because that's something that we just that we all share in common right you know is that family whether it's that sense of of you know uh found family or or or, mm -hmm. or you know biological family whatever and 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 so i just think that it's um it, it it gives it gives the episode even more power and one of the things that i that i think also really gives the episode a lot of power is that gia doesn't lack agency like gia mm -hmm. is, is 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 a character that you know obviously she's willful and she you know makes these decisions and makes some of these powerful decisions and luckily she has some wonderful accomplices um which i'll come back to in a second along the way um, one of my favorite characters in the episode and 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 just a standout performance uh, in the episode as far as I'm concerned is Trace Lysette as Counselor Kate. I just, I mean, every moment um, that she's on screen is incredible, but in particular, the moment when Gia runs away and goes to her, um, some of what she says is so deep and so deeply layered um, and two things that really stood out to me were when she's talking about growing up and she's talking about like, you know, um, uh, she's, she's talking about what she experienced and, and, and ball culture and, 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 you know, and relating to Gia in this way. And, and Gia is so excited to kind of get these, these, you know, these nuggets from her. And then she also 
drops that bomb that of course we were also dealing with a plague and that really like that really hit me um I, basically i want you to talk about all of that <laughs> and i want you to yeah. talk about kate <laughs> i want to talk about that yeah. I, you know so so yeah tell yeah. us about kate tell us about trace tell us about that moment well trace the set is an icon and a and a dream and i am um so lucky that she is a friend and, and colleague and collaborator um and I knew that I was writing this role for her, like from the jump, you know, um, <laughs> and I agree with you. Every moment she's on screen is just breathtaking. Um, but uh, why the role of Counselor Kate is so special to me is because we never get to see these instances of intergenerational trans relationships because mm. we don't have the luxury of a history you know, institutionally, culturally, um, socially. And so we get clues that we, we you know, though some of us saw Paris is burning. Some of us, you know, watch Drag Race and wait for the trans character. But like, ultimately, we don't, uh, we don't have even an oral tradition, you know? We're starting to build one uh, through the media that we make now. But it's so much about relationships, aunties and sisters and, Dunkles that like we talked about and just you know and so to to see I mean the the light in Josie Lynn's eyes when she's watching Trace uh as Counselor Kate give that monologue ab about ball culture like that's real mm -hmm. you're watching a young trans actress look at you know like a legendary trans actress talking about what it was like growing up and we never get to do that with each other we never get to share our wisdom you know, um, and especially not with the youth because we're, you know, there's people get in an uproar about, uh, you know, all sorts of bigoted thoughts. And, and it's just um, one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest successes of um, the forces of darkness has been driving a wedge between queer elders and queer youth um, mm. and using threats and, and, and uh, fear mongering around, you know, pedophilia and, and other like hot button topics to make it scary for people who've grown up queer and lived through it to actually reach out to young queer people and be like, you're going to be okay, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and that, that was very intentional. That's how you like, prevent you know a population from like developing is by severing its connection to its past and so um we're doing we're doing a little bit of healing uh, in this episode sorry i went on a tangent there but you got me on a soapbox so what are you gonna do no That's awesome. it's lovely because one of the things that you know i um in my own personal experience in my my journey and you know is as my therapist says, my unfolding, um, I think that having not having that connection to the past and not having that, that tradition, that story there for, you know, young people in particular to learn from has really closed so many doors and resulted in, in, you know, cause it's a form of oppression and it's resulted yeah. in a lot of repression you know yeah um and and i think that it's so important to be able to establish that and 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 you know as a reminder that like you know we've always been here you know the like this notion that it's like some new thing that's right it's, it's just that's sort of right. like mm -hmm. you know that's the, how obtuse to think that that's the case um so it really it, it really it hit me and it was really wonderfully done yeah, well, that's why I said it in 2012. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Not only because mm -hmm. our show always takes place in the past, but also because, like, you know, acting like this is the first time we're having this conversation. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I I was in high school in the late 90s, and I was part of the queer youth movement fighting for the first gay straight alliances before we were called gay straight alliances. You know. Sure. Um, fun fact about this episode: the poster that gets passed along. Uh, the crowd in the yeah. final game that says hands for quality with the rainbow handprint. I made that poster in my high school when I was wow 
17 years old and uh, the art department recreated it. Uh, but oh, I made wow. that poster as part of a protest when I was a teenager. And so, yeah, we have been here and we have been doing this and especially we have been doing it. I'm going to say we, even though I'm no longer a queer youth, but we have been doing it as young people for generations now, you know, yeah. because it was, it was shocking and groundbreaking in the nineties when queer youth started coming out after eight, you know, um, it, that was wild to people. Um, yeah. But like, you know, it's 2023. <laughs> we've been we've been having queer youth for 30 years, which means the queer youth are now adults and need to take care of the queer youth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I mean, growing up, I think that someone that was very visible to me, for instance, was, you know, watching my so-called life and, and seeing Ricky, seeing Wilson Cruz, you know, and like that was yeah. something that, you know, for me at the time and, and, and yet also, you know, growing up in small town, North Carolina, it was it was also one of those things where going to school and 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 you know wanting to talk about that show first of all you, you know it was like it was it, it was something you couldn't do and you you know and and, and again much like you said you, you know not having anyone to to really connect with and not having those those elders if you will to you know just to let you know that it's okay to let you know that it's yeah. safe um and and i think that that is one of the things that the episode does so well um, you know, speaking of one of the things that I, I, I wanted to ask you about, and I was going to save this for the end, but it feels kind of like a natural place is that, you know, Ian is, I mean, we love Mason and, and, you know, Mason's just awesome. And, and, and Ian is, I, I think a fan favorite character for a lot of folks, um, seeing their journey throughout the course of this episode and learning more uh, about them and the, you know, the deepening of their character was thrilling. We had read in an audition side, I believe that there was a scene initially where Ian went to visit an adult Gia, um, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm curious if that scene was, was actually filmed, um, or if it was one of those that didn't, you know, that didn't quite make it, uh, before the cameras. Um, and if it didn't, what the decision was to, to, you know, to not include that. It was a casualty of COVID. Oh, we, um, wow. We had an, an outbreak in our uh, last day on the campus, and we had to shut down in the middle of shooting. And we were oh. supposed to shoot that scene that night, and we didn't get to pick it up. And, you know, I, um, there, you've got you to gotta take a lot of hits in this business, you know? So um, I kind of looked at the script, and when we were figuring out what we could do to salvage and reshoot the scenes that we had to reshoot, we rebuilt the locker room on the lot because we we were set up to shoot and then we had to call filming. So, wow. um, so the scene just had to go. You know, we didn't. So I and 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 it's ultimately okay because sacrificing that scene and then um, getting what we get of seeing Mason, seeing Ian enjoying the game and yeah. leaning their head on Addison's shoulder. And then going straight to Dottie's sketchbook is wild. Yeah. You know, it's wild because you're like, wait a minute. They went into the imaging chamber and now they're fucking leaping? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> I completely agree. Uh, so quick question about that. If Ben had turned around, would he have seen Ian or, or would he have only seen Addison? No, so we talked about it. I think that Ben would have seen Ian, but because there's so much cheering and commotion, they didn't, you know, Ben couldn't hear one voice over another. Sure, but yeah, sure. That's why, I also had a moment of, they were in different versions of the script of like, uh, Ben almost catching Ian and, and then the principal coming up and Ian like being like, authority and like running away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's lovely. Um, Ah, and uh, so another thing that I loved about the episode is that when Ian makes the distinction between ally and accomplice, yeah, um, uh, just so lovely and something that frankly, I don't know. I mean, maybe I had heard it articulated that way before, but I don't know that I had, at least it didn't land on me in such a way. Sure. Um, and Addison's journey as it pertains to that. Um, yeah. 
you spoke earlier about the trans ban monologue um, and Caitlin has just, I, I mean, she's just been killing it. And, and I, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's like, this is your first gig. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let me tell you about the magic of that monologue that was shot on veterans day hmm. on our second day of shooting, which was my first day directing. I didn't learn I was directing until I was driving to sit. Um, and Caitlin and I were talking about it and we had talked about the script a bit and, you know, this need to like, like I said, welcome people in from different points of view. And she said to me, you know, I feel like it's really just about like, you know, helping the people who you can, who were like in your command. And I was like, well, do you want to just say that? And so we did the monologue like once or twice and then checked in and I was like, okay, we're going to do it and just like let the camera roll. And what's so magical about that moment is you see this veteran on Veterans Day basically confessing that she didn't do enough to stop the trans ban as a character, but as a person saying these words, you know, which I think will land on a lot of people who feel a connection to the military and feel conflicted about trans kids or trans people. And it was just this like, it's so hard sometimes to admit when we fail as an ally and we fail all the time. We don't know how to show up. We put our foot in our mouth. We say the wrong thing. We, you know, laugh at something that we shouldn't laugh at and like, you know, whatever. There's so many ways. And it's like just being able to be like, ah, I didn't do it right that time. And I, I really want to do it better next time. Like that is, that's such a simple thing, but it can be so hard to admit. And Caitlin literally walks us through that, like all of us, you know, and it's so special. And uh, yeah, it was like one of those sacred moments in, in, you know, production when like there, you could just hear a pin drop. We were all just, you know, on every bated breath. What is that the expression? Just yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, it is an incredible moment, and 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 I loved it, and I and I love the fact that we have gotten this recurring theme almost of Addison recounting these moments, not necessarily of failure. Um, but certainly moments where maybe she's disappointed herself because that's something in paging Dr. Song that I think we got too, you know, with having to learn mm -hmm. how to tell someone that their child had died, you know, and here having yeah. to learn how to, you know, and, you know, how, and I think it's just this wonderful piece of, of, of character, uh, growth that we're, that we're seeing. Um, and I, 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 I'm curious as to how much, you know, when you're, when you're writing the script and you're, and you're, you know, kind of uncovering these moments, um, how much, you know, having the room uh, influences some of those, those moments of character growth. Um, you know, is it like something yeah. that everybody kind of gets together and says like, we want them to go there and this is how we have to do it. We chart the long arc together, you know, um, we kind of make decisions about where we think, through a lot of conversation where we think characters need to start and end and what kind of things might happen over the course of the season that push them along that journey. For Addison, you know, Caitlin was really upfront that like she didn't want to be a squeaky, squeaky clean character. She wanted to have, you know, complicated background. She, she wasn't afraid of controversy. And so we've been trying to find ways to, you know, give Addison that complexity. So she's not just like us sidekick asking how Ben's feeling all the time mm. and one thing I think is also like really important to remember as we like learn more about Addison's backstory and her you know the struggles that she's trying to heal with Ben's absence is that she was supposed to be the leaper yeah. you know and like what drives someone to want to just go back in time and change shit and risk their lives you know you got to yeah. have a kind of I'm not going to say death wish but you got to have a kind of like unresolved past if you're willing to throw yourself into unquestionable time you know what i mean yeah. so mm -hmm. I, I think it's kind of cool that we're that we're seeing this stuff come up from addison 
Yeah. Well, and, and I have to admit that I'm playing with a little bit of a stacked deck because I know, I know where we're headed as it pertains to mm -hmm. Addison. Um, cool, and, cool. uh, and, 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 you know, and, and where some of that, you know, might come from. Um, but I just think that the, the pieces that, that were being given about the characters, you know, each episode, um, have just been adding these really rich layers, not only to the characters themselves, but just to the themes that the, that the yeah. show has been tackling so well. Um, so I'm, I'm curious that, you know, with, with Ian in this episode, yeah. You know they have this incredible moment of vulnerability with Addison, and um, it's I mean it's a it's a dark place to go, and yeah. and and obviously like the the way that you know Mason plays it, the way that it's written, there's also this sense of grace about it all too, and this sense of hope and love and and, and joy even. And um, yeah. I would love to know more about that moment because it's a big thing. To, to write one of your characters having that that moment where they almost yeah. took their own lives. So I, I, I'd yeah. love to know more about that decision. Well, I mean, um, there was no way we were not going to have that conversation in this episode because it's such an yeah. uh, epidemic for trans youth. Um, uh, this episode is inspired by two of my dear friends who took their own lives um, and um, two of several, I would say, you know, uh, trans and queer friends who, who who didn't make it and um and that's my story what Ian is saying there you know and I and and I don't know if it's Mason's story but I know Mason connected to it and I and I know that so many people connect to this dark truth that you know trans and oftentimes queer um young people try to take their own lives and, and, and can be successful at it from a very young age. Michael Maronis, uh, you know, um, in North Carolina, he was bullied for liking My Little Pony and he hung himself at 11, you know? Mm -hmm. um, he only died like last year, but he was, you know, um, severely disabled for the rest of his short life, you know? And so these are, and, and these just these keep happening. You know what I mean? It just keeps happening. And so unless we really talk about it and say, you know, like I went on Newsmax and did an interview once when I was going on tour to North Carolina when they first passed the like, very first anti-trans bathroom. Day. And I did an interview on Newsmax and I looked like right at that anchor and, I, and he was talking about his daughters and not wanting me in the same bathroom. It was like, if you had a choice between a trans daughter and a dead daughter, which would you choose? And he started to get choked up this like Newsmax guy, you know, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, what we're not, we're, we're, we're getting all, you know, argumentative and talking point and wedge with you. And we're not talking about the fact that there is a problem of youth suicide, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and trans youth suicide in particular. And so, you know, the, um, the chart that we had made you see Ian look down at a tablet and there is an infographic that plays out of all the risks that you run away face. And then it increases for all the risks that trans run away face. And this, these are really real statistics from the Trevor Project. And, and I had, you know, our, our, our um, graphics team like built this out because we just wanted to drive it home that it's like, sure. people are targeting a very vulnerable population, you know, and they know that they're doing it. And most of us are sitting idly by while it happens. And, um, and to your point about the, um, the accomplice thing, I first want to give credit that the term terminology of accomplice in this context comes from the Standing Rock water protection movement. And so it's rooted in Native American organizing, but it has like in the last six years, found its footing in a lot of different movements. But this idea that there was a time when, when being an ally meant something, you know, but then you can buy a rainbow bracelet at Urban Outfitters and call yourself an ally. You know what I mean? Like, sure. what does it take to help change things for people who are in danger? And it takes skin in the game. It takes putting yourself at risk. It takes having a conversation that makes you uncomfortable. It takes talking to your superior about something you think is unfair, you know, all the things that we show in the episode, um, 
we're trying to encourage people to do. I'm so sorry that that happened to your friends. And I am so grateful that you would share that not only with us, but with everyone through, um, through this, you know, beautiful episode, because when I was doing a little research beforehand, then, and this is like just this past week, even before I saw the episode, you know, I wanted to have the actual numbers, you know, and just reading that trans youth are eight times as likely to take their own lives. Um, you know, I, I knew I didn't necessarily have to have that number because obviously you were gonna, you know, you were going to cover it, <laughs> yeah. touch on it in some way, but like, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's again, you know, going back to what I said earlier, it's, it's the thing that I always come back to, you know, because it's, it's so beautifully, I mean, it's, it's a horrible way. It's a horrible thing, but it's beautifully written in the episode about Gia, for instance, becoming lost. And then Addison, you know, having that line about her being erased. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the thing, you know, I, I hesitate to, to talk about this because I don't know necessarily that it's, you know, my story to tell. And yet at the same time, I watched it and I, you know, and I ended up commenting on it. But on Twitter, there was someone who was, you know, basically talking about how, um, you know, they didn't believe in pronouns and they weren't going to ask for your pronouns and they weren't going to, you know, and Mason interacted with this person. And uh, at one point, the person responded with something like, you act like I'm trampling over your existence when the truth of the matter is, is you're just so married to this idea, blah, 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 blah. You know, we're just trying, we're just, you know, we just have a, we just have a civil disagreement about this. And I, and I couldn't help but say, I was like, disagree? Like, no, this isn't something yeah. that's up for debate because you are trampling yeah. on their existence. You are invalidating our experience. And, you know, you are the least you can do. The literal least you could do is honor someone's pronouns. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I agree. I think it's just, it's, it's, it's incredibly important. And, and I, and I, I, you know, it feels like in a way that even just by airing the episode that NBC, you know, is kind of acting as an accomplice. And I love that. <laughs> I, they are. They are. And I'll say because I think that I've held their feet to the fire as an uh, artist that they've worked with now for um, a number of years. And I feel like it's really cool that, I mean, I'm still young in the game, you know, like I, I have my credits and I'm proud of my credits, but like, you know, I'm not what you would call an A-lister yet. And and yet, uh, NBC has, like, you know, kind of come to the mat with me about some really important issues. I mean, when we were doing Connecting uh, and, and NBC canceled an episode of Connecting uh, to host the Trump town hall when Trump refused to debate Biden, uh, oh. I, like, I, I shamed them on Twitter. I literally was like, shame on NBC for, you know, canceling this show that like was, you know, didn't, can well, they canceled us eventually, but you know, whatever. I just called them out <laughs> sure. for like yeah. offering a platform to bigotry when we were like airing a show about like radical inclusivity and, and community in terms of hardship. Yeah. And, um, and all these people on Twitter were like, oh, Sakina should be fired. You can't talk to her employer that way. You know, the truth is that like I I spoke out the way that I always have and mm -hmm. you know it caused all the showrunners to write a collective letter you know like it was like a, it was a big um there was a big statement made and maybe that was already going to be made but I beat them to it and that's fine <laughs> all I'm saying is when I said to NBC like let's do this episode and they said okay I said but we're going to do it right every step of the way and that meant starting early on the breaking of the story that meant having a glad consultant with us um, not only to make sure we got things right but also to make sure I was safe because I'm putting my trauma on the line for this next you know yeah. what I mean and this show yeah. so um, it's, it's there have been aspects to this process that I feel have been really modeled for bringing in an underrepresented early career artist and giving them the platform to use the larger institution to tell an untold story. And it takes a lot of careful balancing of like 
all the T's that need to be crossed and, and I's that need to be dotted for the network and the studio to feel safe taking these risks. And also for me to feel like I'm trusting you all to, to put this story forward authentically and not dumb it down or rely on harmful tropes. And, um, you know, I really credit um, Martin and, and Dean for uh, walking through that with me because um, uh, they will be the first to tell you that I, um, I, I'm, I will take all feedback, but I will also give feedback. So, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a really wonderful uh, collaborative process. Um, truly, never a fight. Always, everybody on board from, and I, 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 I just can't express this enough from like the PAs and the, the, the camera operators and the, the picture car guy and the art department <laughs> all the way to the studio exec. Like there is a feeling of pride in this episode. And mm. I just, I feel it and I am grateful for it. And I'm also like, that's right. You know, yeah. it's about time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we want to be respectful of your time, but I do want to hit you with a couple of quick questions. Um, um, because, uh, one of the things that this episode does clearly is it, it deepens some of the, the mythology, some of what we've learned thus far. And one of the things that happens early that I, that is certainly our first on-screen confirmation is that Ian remembers Gia playing in the game. Uh, yeah. and what a great moment because obviously Addison knows that that's something that, you know, Ben changed and Ziggy knows, yeah. um, you know, talk about the decision to, to do that, to write that in and what that means maybe for the project as a whole and how they view sure. the changes that Ben's making in the past. Yeah, it's a, it is, there's like a lot of little precedent breaking things that we do in the episode and that's one of them. And what I love, also the line of the invested by technology <laughs> and give to Mason and I want it in his shirt. It's such a good line. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so part of the reason why this, that we, this came up in this episode was because um, I mentioned the, you know, the friends that I lost along the way. And there was, uh, when I was a kid doing queer youth organizing in my high school, trying to start a club and having riots and walkouts and things. Um, the year after I dropped out and moved away, another kid in like a district over um, uh, started the same fight. And it got like huge press. And there were, you know, city council meetings and, and um, I came down back from school and like uh, helped lead, lead a vigil for the community to like fight for the right for this, this kid to have a club. Um, later, uh, after high school, she became Lady Justice and she was performing as a, a drag artist. Um, and then uh, she was found hanging from a tree. And uh, I was like, I got out, you know, we were in the fight together, but I got out and she didn't. And um, my other friend Gia, who the character Gia is named after, because they wouldn't let me call the character Justice, I tried. Um, but, I, you know, whatever, she's named after the girl. Um, Gia similarly you know like didn't didn't make it and I did and I I wanted to explore that dynamic through Ian and their relationship to growing up in like the time and place of when Gia was in school also and having that like oh yeah she was an icon she was legendary we all knew about her but something terrible happened um and so that's where this impetus of like having Ian have memories of Gia at all came from was like exploring that that personal relationship to me and, and the character that that I was creating. Um, but then the sort of treat of getting to figure out how that dynamic plays out in our technology and our mythology opens up a lot of doors 
um, because we haven't yet seen a change in the past affect the lives of our characters in the present. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a, in a spiritual symbolic way, like I have literally given Lady Justice and Gia like new life through this episode. Sure. And in a sort of like fun, creative, you know, mythological TV writing way, we have also made more opportunity for Quantum Leap to change history. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I loved it. And it was definitely a moment that made me just, you know, lead forward and say, oh, how cool that we're seeing this. Because it's been something that, you know, fans have debated since the original series. And, right. um, you know, and, and I think that th that's the thing about the show in general. And, and, and this episode, certainly, and I think on a deeper level, is, is, is you, you talk about kind of the impetus for this. And it just proves all of the layers that you all are really putting into each and every episode. Um, and I loved having the opportunity, you know, by the time this drops, I'll have seen the episode, you know, three or four times. <laughs> uh, at this point, I've only watched it twice. But it's so funny because watching it that first time, I felt like it almost happened too fast. You know, it's like, oh, I want to spend it more time. At uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was so, yeah, I was so surprised and taken back when Ben leaped. I was not expecting. <laughs> I was I not know. expecting it at the end. But it's something that we that we always talk about on the show is that sometimes we have the leaper stick around so we can see like like the final moments with the character. But then when you think about it, those moments get taken away from the leapy. So yeah. it's so it's wonderful to see Ben leap out at this moment. But you know that Dad is coming back and Dad gets to celebrate with yeah. his daughter when he comes and, back. And and also I love that we get to imagine trans futures because mm -hmm. that doesn't happen you know yeah. and literally every audience member in the moment that ben leaps is like what happened and their mind's gonna go maybe this and suddenly we have introduced yeah. a whole new multiverse of trans possibility because a bunch of people have taken a moment to imagine what's possible for trans kids i love that uh, me too and the idea that you know that the the, the, the kids from group you know get to experience this moment too mm -hmm. i thought was just so beautiful and to see kate show up there and i mean uh the the moment with the the living portraits um it's a very yeah. different kind of moment for the episode um yeah. talk a little bit about the decision to shoot it that way the decision to have that i mean the monologue obviously is brilliant and i and i we i, I don't think we know the actor's name uh who delivers that do you do you have that i could i i could get uh not off hand that's you know? totally fine <laughs> um, sorry no it's totally fine yeah. send it to us well, later the, we'll the drop it in but the, yeah it was a two it was it was not a monologue mm. um and the monologue came later and he did come back to record it later but it was really a very short moment. And I was like, I, but I knew I wanted these living portraits. And I, I thought that the scene that I had written for the support group would sort of play while the living portraits were happening. And then when we shot it, we realized it was like kind of too complicated. And Martin was like, I think we just need like one monologue. So I wrote that later. Mm. And we oh, put it wow. and we put it in. And it then of course it just the magic happened. But those yeah. living portraits are the last shots we shot on the rescheduled day after COVID when we had to come back and rebuild the set in a whole new place. Oh my gosh. Um, and wow. literally that shot of jo of Josie Lynn that is like, I don't see the harm in that, but I do see the harm in blocking it. Like that was the last shot we shot of the mm. episode. Mm. And mm. and it is it is kind of like uh, you know, I'm a theater nerd too, and those moment that is uh for me like an alienation effect moment. that's a b effect moment yeah you know yeah. it is like we don't do it in our show it's not part of quantum leap it's definitely mm -hmm. a conscious choice by the writer and director to like stop you and make you look at these kids while you're hearing this thing it is out of time of there's no point of view on it like it's not mm -hmm. from ben or Addison. so it was really just i'm i'm really thankful to you know, the showrunners for letting me kind of take some of these creative leaps in this episode, because I think that's, that w that's what makes it feel like a contained offering, you know, it like it, it really, there's, there's aspects to it that are kind of cinematic, you know, that yeah. 
soar above what you might expect for, uh, you know, sci-fi procedural on, on <laughs> prime time. Well, it, you know, when when we had Dean on the show, one of the things that he said is that you know the the hope was to continue really pushing the boundaries of what the show can do and what it can be. And um, I, you know, I think at the time, you know, I just thought of like in terms of storytelling, like you, you know, and, and plots and stories and that sort of stuff. But visually, you know, and 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 taking that, you know, and that cinematic and that theatrical element and bringing that in, it, it goes hand in hand with that. And I and I really do hope that we get to continue seeing that the, those boundary pushing moments um a moment that might not necessarily be quite as boundary pushing in a way but still felt theatrical almost in like a a fugue sort of manner is that final basketball scene where you know gia is confronted with all of this you know transphobic stuff and it and she does she disconnects you know from herself from the game from everything and to me and i, I this might sound hyperbolic and i apologize but to me one of the moments of genius of the episode is bringing Ben in to have this moment with the team, with the girls, and refocusing Gia, and then going back out there and focusing on the messages of love and the messages of support. And it's so right. beautifully done. And the thing that the episode does we talked a lot about with the classic series that there are a few episodes that feel like the leap happens to Sam. Sam doesn't happen to the leap. And in general, mm. I don't like those episodes. I just don't think there's, I feel disconnected from them. And I think that this episode could very much run the risk of doing that with Ben. And yet it doesn't sure. like, and it's, and it's, and this moment in particular really brings it back around because it's bookended by these two decisions that Ben makes, right? Like to put Gia yeah. in the game and then to bring Gia back so that she can reconnect, right? And yeah. it it just plays. It's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. What's it like to shoot a basketball game, to film a basketball game? And yeah. in that final, in, the, in those final moments with the basketball game, there's so much going on. And yet I feel like, again, everything, you know, plays so wonderfully. So again, in filming that, in writing that, how do you do that? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, the editing is great. Hyper, just the the the, the fun of the ball game, it took care of itself. You know, <laughs> the um, the uh, the how of it. You know, I have to give a lot of credit to Ray and to Mornike because they both are b ballers, and I am not. You know, <laughs> my story is such that I stopped playing basketball when I hit puberty because I was like, I'm just, I don't want to be with these boys. And you know, I was reclaiming that in this episode as well. And you know, That's we awesome. had um, a few ringers, like professional ball players, and we had our actors, and we had um, a basketball choreographer, like a fight choreographer or a dance choreographer. Um, and so we knew we needed specific shots that Morinike had storyboarded. And so we had our choreographer create a series of passes and plays that were pretty brief. And, um, you know, the, the shortest one was literally maybe a five second play. The longest one is maybe 25, 30 seconds. And then we would play the, the, the actors would learn it with the, the actual pro ball players. And then we would play it on the court for the cameras so everyone could watch. Then we shot it first from above with the crane, which was like literally my dream, like working with a crane is the coolest <laughs> thing you could ever do. We shot it first with the crane and, um, and getting the crowd in and everything. And then we had our camera team wearing these gigantic like exoskeleton steady cam rigs so they could <laughs> be running around with the, with the girls. And wow. because we had watched it a couple times, it was like the the guys knew and every so the camera operator is like wearing their rig and then someone else helping them move around so they don't crack. So we had our, you know, 10 girls on the court plus our six camera people um, walking backwards with these giant cameras. And uh, yeah, it was just super fun, you know? And then, like I said, the magic is in the editing, you know? Um, yeah and the, the dynamism and stuff. But it was just like, we knew when we were shooting it, how good it was going to be. We could just tell, you know, it was like yeah. so awesome. Yeah. This is a question. I don't know if you would know this or not. And I have a chance to go look. The gym that you're shooting in looks very much like the same gym that they shot the basketball game and the classic series episode, The Leap Home Part One. 
Do you happen to know if it's oh, the same gym? I don't think gym? it is, but that's funny. Oh, okay. No, I, I don't think I it mean, is. all gyms you know, look a little shot, bit alike, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we shot it for Dougal Hills High School. I, 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 I would be interested to find out if, if the original series got there. But um, yeah, we shot it for Dougal Hills up in the valley. Or oh, okay. Valley? I don't know where it is. Northeast <laughs> of the city. <laughs> mm. So it sounds like basketball was something that was just important to you to include regardless. And the connection <laughs> that Dennis brings up, obviously, to the classic series, I mean, it's an incredible, like, basketball carries a lot of weight. So I'm wondering, yeah. was there any intent there? Or was it just one of those sort of happy accidents? It was a happy accident. It was, but it's actually, you know, I originally wrote it to be about soccer because I was so inspired by the ladybugs as like source material. And also because my yeah. niece played soccer and I wanted her to like the episode. Um, <laughs> but uh, but then when we were like, okay, it's really hard to shoot on grass. Let's put it in a court and have less players. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, that's when it really opened up to me because I could then use my story because I, I had no connection to either, but you know, the soccer at all. Like, but I remember what it was like to, to play as a kid to play basketball and then to suddenly feel like I couldn't you know and um so I could bring that to you know and then the whole thing you're talking about about when you know when Gia's being distracted by the haters I mean that's just the truth of it and that's like whether that's basketball or your schoolwork or you know like anything and your mental health I mean that's just what life is like when you are being bullied and so uh I'm just glad that we got to make it such a tactile illustration of that. So, because I just feel like there's no way you could get through this episode and not walk away with like a new understanding of what it's like to move through the world as a trans young person. Yeah. Like you just, you can't, unless you are just hard hearted and full of hate, like you can't sit there and watch this and not be softened you know and i and that's that's awesome i hope it works yeah well i mean that's one of the things you know when the the scene with um with kate and g and and her parents well and ben um the that moment where kate says you know don't see her transness as a burden um mm -hmm. and i i think that that's so wonderful right because here are these parents that are from, you know, all parents is doing everything right, right? And yet yeah. there's still that element of like, and then Gia has that incredibly powerful line about, you know, your fear is not my responsibility. Um, how could people not take that, you know, in? How could people not learn I from that? So. <laughs> I hope so. You know, when I watch it back now and I think about all the like, the love that I put into these kernels like that, and, you know, and it's like, we live, we consume media, you know, we devour, we're like the hungry caterpillars, like never enough. And so you, everyone in the quantum leap writers room, like put so much blood, sweat and tears into each episode. And the earnestness of our show is, is core to its value. And we love it. And we want to be, making the world a better place through one hour of television a night. But you always hope that like, sometimes you can, you can hit it right so that the message like really lasts, really lingers, really hits home, you know, so that like 30 years from now, people are like, I remember seeing that episode, the way that we feel about some of these two episodes from the you know, original and like, I think this one has the power to do that, you know, especially for the kids who need to see it and their parents who need to see it. But, you know, yeah, I just, I hope that it can be a beacon of light for the ones that are in darkness. I think it absolutely can. I think that just like that basketball game and that moment of sort of recentering and refocusing Gia, I really think that there are people that can see this and feel that as well I you know one of the things I read earlier is you called it a care bear stare of joy um <laughs> yeah. and, and you know I think that that's beautiful because right now there are so many messages of, of hate and and the thing that's so difficult sometimes when confronting those is that the people that are projecting those don't see it 
as being a message of hate. You know, all they see is their their rightness, you know, and I don't mean that politically. Yeah. They just think they're right, you know, and um, and the wonderful thing about this episode is it doesn't think it's right. It just is. And and I love that. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I know that that it will stir up some vitriol, but I'm just not worried. I mean, also, I, I ran, I blocked all the turf, so I'm fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> I do think, but I'm just like, there's, I just, the, the the tidal wave of love that will come through and from this episode is so much greater and grander than the pitiful hatred that people are trying to spit in our direction i just like i'm i'm happy that we're we're moving the right direction right on thank you so much this has been an absolute joy um i do yeah, however thanks guys I have yes. one last question to ask you, and you uh -oh. might not uh -oh, be okay. able to answer it. But, <laughs> I, but so I want to save it for the end. There is no waiting room. When the <laughs> waiting room is gone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dean, <laughs> Dean even sidestepped that question. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's the thing we're putting on TikTok right there. That's yeah, it. that's the yeah. That's, that's the snippet right there. Thank you for settling that. Uh, <laughs> uh no I, I i'm very curious and i know other people will be curious was it always going to be ian was that always going to be the Dottie's reveal or were there talks about perhaps having it be someone else nice yeah from like from like before the pilot i think or at least from uh. like my day one in the writer's room we've been waiting for this moment um that that's in that same article that where I talk about the Care Bears there, I, I mentioned like, oh, we just it's so good to finally take the trans character and be like, boom, yeah, story, you know? because <laughs> right. they've been like the they've been like the queer bestie in the corner, you know, like, and um, which is like it, it takes a few episodes, you know, to build the trust and build the community and understand the main relationships, but this is, you know, yeah. a nice a nice moment for 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 Ian and for Ian's fans for sure. Absolutely. Well, I know that some people were a little sad with that we didn't get to see them a couple of weeks ago. So it's nice that they're they're front uh -huh. and center here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing your time with us. It's really been a joy to have for you on the sure. show. Um, I, I meant what I said. I've said this a couple of times. I, I had the, you know, the, the the fortune to say it to you personally last night immediately after I watched the episode, but it it has had a direct impact on me just even knowing that it's coming um, the show in general has had a huge impact on me, even when I did not expect that at all. Um, but I welcome it. I cherish it. And I'm just grateful for uh, your all's work. Um, and I cannot wait for everyone to see this and be able to take it in um, and just give you all of the uh, applause or as magic did the snaps um, <laughs> yeah, <thank laughs> that, you. <laughs> that you that you so richly deserve as well as the rest of the cast and the crew and I'm glad that the editors got another shout out because the editing work on the show is phenomenal so mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So cool. so awesome. thank well, you so much thank you thank you yeah pleasure absolutely have a wonderful take night take care you too. Ah, uh, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah, it really was. I was very quiet during our interviews, like I always am, but that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you can tell me to shut up anytime. <laughs> no, I, 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 I get a little starstruck sometimes. And, and like, like we said during the thing, this came on us so fast today. I was working all day long. I literally had like two hours before. Betsy, by the way, she took on a lot of extra load tonight to make it happen uh, because Aww. she was, when I told her, she was very excited about it. So she, yeah, she, she, she moved a lot of things to make tonight happen. So thank you again, Betsy. Appreciate it. But yeah. That's so that uh, I'm glad you thank you, Betsy. Yeah. Uh on, on my end, it was it was actually ended up being a pretty standard day around here. I uh, mm -hmm. you know, it was uh, took Hattie to preschool, um, you know, played with Jude. Uh he went down for his nap. Uh Hattie had a doctor's appointment and then we got back, did some more playing, then I made dinner and uh we had dinner and then uh, kids went down. And uh, I watched the episode again, and we did this. So yeah. <laughs> it was kind of just my, my day. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, no, Shakina's awesome. You can find out more about Shakina um, at her website, shakina.nyc. Um, um, and of course, uh, you know, I'm just so grateful for uh, not only her appearance on her, on our show, but her, um, her work um, on this yeah. episode and, uh, and just her work on the show in general. You know, I think that she's, she's brought so much clearly and, you know, talking about the work that she did on transparent, the work that she did on connecting, um, I, 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 you know, two Im- important shows um, obviously, and, and bringing transparent to a close. Like I, I love the way that she put that, that uh, working on a legacy show and bringing it to a close and then working on a, a legacy show and, and bringing it back to life um, and, and, and having that experience, I, I think is just really, really cool um you know and 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 with connecting you know she was the first trans person to have a starring role um on a network show so i mean i think that that's that that's pretty pretty incredible um and we're just we're just lucky to to have been able to share that uh, with her and 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 uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed it as much as we did. I know that uh, you know, given the nature of some of our conversation, I I, I didn't have permagrin the whole time, um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guarantee you, uh, I was pretty damn happy throughout the entirety of that. So thank you to Shakina. Uh, shout out to to Dean Jarderis as usual for you know just having our back in general he's probably gonna hate that i said that but i'm saying it so uh, yeah <laughs> and uh and being so generous and, and and wonderful um and uh yeah any anything anything else before we get out of here dennis no i'm really looking for it i'm i mean just what the general message of this episode I, I can't say more than i already have but also the continuation of the mystery I, yeah. I'm just waiting to see what I posted last night, y'all. I was not only talking <laughs> about about the message of the leap story, but just everything that we learned. I'm I'm just so excited to see what happens the rest well, of the it, season. I, you know, I have to be honest. I'll keep it brief, but I have to be honest. There were a couple of times when I just felt like we should end this now because you know what she just said was beautiful, and let's just stop. And then I was like, no, I got to get there. We got to get to the last, you know, to that last question that I want to ask. And and even when we got to that last moment before I asked it, I was just sort of like, maybe we should just end this. And then I was like, no, screw it, I'm going to ask anyway. And 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 she just made it better because you know that this episode, which is so important uh, about trans visibility in, in general, you know, she's able to talk about this moment of pushing a trans character trans actor right to the forefront of the show and that you know and, and and with that revelation it was always going to be ian like it's just lovely and and i felt like you know in the end it was a little bit of a gamble on my part because she gave us some beautiful potential endings before that but i still felt like you know what no i'm gonna go for yeah. this last one and and it was an, and again it was like nope we got it. This is where we should stop. And, uh, yeah. and I, and I think that that, it, it, that can kind of be almost the lasting impact of the episode for, for the show, right? Like for the story, mm-hmm. for the mythology is it's like, you're still getting this, you know, this incredibly, uh, you know, you're, you're getting Ian kind of thrust into that, into that spotlight, into the midst of all of this. Um, and, and, and I think it's uh it's a pretty cool moment for, you know, for, for Ian fans, um, yeah. you know, for Mason fans, which, you know, clearly we, we are as is betsy yeah um (laughs) (laughs) so anyway uh, um we will be back next time to talk about family style uh which looks like it's going to be another fun one and that is directed by none other than deborah pratt so we're super excited uh to see uh, her work uh in the in the next episode um obviously we've talked about her presence um before with with other writers and dean and um you know, made some guesses uh, at times, uh, but to to know that this is one that she was like literally in there on, it'll be a lot of fun. And I thought it was such a cool leap out too. And Ben, you know, was just like awesome, you know, and to be excited I know, I think, in the in the kitchen. The that was first, cool. Is this the first time ever that we've had a leap in where where the leaper was actually really excited to be where they were, other than the leap home part one, right? Maybe. I think it's a first. Yeah, I think it might be. I I think it might be, actually. Um, Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's neat, too, because, you know, just before this, being involved with basketball, like, clearly that's something that Ben loves. And, you know, Ben was was adept at, you know, at kind of, like, taking on that that persona, Um, which begs questions, too. We didn't get a chance to ask, but, like, is that part of his plan, right? Like, has he he planned his trajectory based around people he could leap into so that, you know, he has some experience? Um, Mm. I don't think that's the case. I don't think think he's targeted the leaps in that way, but... 
yeah. uh anyway um yeah so that'll be a lot of fun uh i believe yeah. we put those the, the press photos already on our website so you can check those out um you know beware of, of spoilers although i don't think there's really any heavy spoilers at, at all in the images that we received yeah. from the from the episode so if you want a little heads up on what the episode might contain check out those uh those press photos over on the website and and we'll keep bringing you that stuff uh as soon as we get it uh it was a little weird this time because we kind of got two at two once for one. yeah and yeah yeah um we we got the screener early this time around so um it you know it certainly makes things um exciting uh yeah. uh to you know to have that and be able to share it with you and um you know whatever part we can play in in, in hyping up uh the show as it goes on we'll certainly we'll certainly do that uh, unless it just jumps the shark totally and we're like what is this crap but uh no <laughs> <laughs> we 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 we're we're kind of incapable of doing that uh to to, yeah. be, to be honest uh, yeah we, we're pretty pretty in love with the show so um yeah well anyway on that note, let's leap out of here. Uh, thanks for listening. Leave us some feedback. Podcast at gmail.com. Leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. And, uh, yeah, unless we have something special spring up, we'll be back in two weeks for family style. Indeed. Indeed we will. Thank you all Indeed. so much. Take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. Stay safe out there. And remember to always leap responsibly. Bye-bye.